Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Mark Ramsey, and he is from the Lewis Educational Agriculture Farm, the LEAF. It's a 15-acre 501c3 nonprofit educational farm in South Southington, Connecticut. Uh, Mark is the seventh, seventh generation of his family to run the farm. Currently, the LEAF runs a year-round CSA program, a seasonal farm stand, and an online store in addition to numerous charitable and community programs. Mark and his team grow a wide variety of vegetables and cut flowers and strive to create an inclusive and welcoming place for all. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Michael. So tell me, uh, what was it like growing up on a farm with six generations? Were you expected to continue or was that a choice that, you know, you could have gone off and done something else? Well, I think anybody that grows up on a farm or is born into this, um, it's, it's probably in your blood. Mm. Um, it wasn't expected, um, yeah. but both all of my brothers ended up working on the farm. Uh, eventually the other two brothers left the farm. I stuck, I stuck around. Okay. Um, but I love doing what I do. Um, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Um, it's just in the blood. I mean, yeah. I love that. I love having my hands and feet in the dirt. I love growing yes. things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's there's that kind of just itch that you get, and uh, it's the it's the excitement aspect of when the snow leaves, and you're like, I can't wait to get out and plant. Or yeah, uh, you get the seed catalogs out and start looking through and figuring out what you want to do for the next year, and uh, planning all the educational programs. And uh, yeah, yeah. So talk to us about the history, because again, we've talked about you the seventh generation. It's been in your family since 1780. Um, is it always been 15 acres? Was it much larger and kind of gotten smaller? Yeah, it was, it was substantially larger um, years ago when I was in high school, which was just a few years ago. Yep. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I graduated high school, it was over 300 acres. Um, okay. It's, the farm has changed over the years quite a bit. Um, I think at its largest, it was over 400 acres my great grandparents and my grandparents were doing it. Um, you know, if you have a disaster, we had a, uh, a, uh, hailstorm go through, uh, mm -hmm. when we were in the orchard business and basically in 15 minutes, it wiped out the whole crop and we had it insured. We had some insurance on it, but we, you know, you never have enough and, uh, you know, quarter million dollar loss in 15 minutes, you know, how do you recover? You have to sell a piece of land. Mm. Um, We've never sold land though, just to sell land. We, you know, it's always been to cover something that had gone wrong, you know, either naturally or yeah, um, to pay debts off or, you know, yeah. we, so, we love our so, land. We love our land and we wouldn't just sell it to put houses on it. We have hey. preserved, we have preserved over 140 acres of the farm that we did. Uh, we did hundred acres through the state of Connecticut. And we also did 40 acres through the town um, that can never be built on. So ah, we okay. have saved, saved a good portion of it. So then you're, it's 15 acres in production and then how many acres total or how does that work? Um, well, and we do also, uh, we, we lease some land that we grow on. Um, okay. There's part, some of the land is swamp land, um, you know, with, for irrigation purposes, we have a, a pond on that. Um, it, 15 acres is actually in production. Gotcha. Okay. That's actually, that's about almost the exact same size when we were upstate New York farming. Um, okay. that's, that's kind of where we were at the end. We were managing around 500 acres and then we were planting about 15. Now it's, you, it's amazing so, what we produce on those 15 acres. I mean, we produce a lot of product. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then you look like you have a relatively sandy soil. We do. It's a, it's a fine sandy loom. Um, we have actually beautiful growing land. Uh, it's about 12 to 18 inches deep, no wow. rocks. Nice. As fast as my tractor can pull the plow, that's as fast as we can plow. Yeah. 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 Now let's talk a little bit about, um, so about 15 acres in production. What does that crop mix consist of? Uh, pretty much A to Z. Uh, if you can grow it in Connecticut, 
um, we grow it. Um, everything from artichokes to zucchini. Okay. Uh, All right. Most, you know, we, we try to grow a lot of different things because of our CSA program. Yeah. Um, we are very diverse because we don't want to give them the same vegetables for three weeks in a row. Yes. So we grow a, a wide variety of everything. Okay. Now, um, with the farm, with that, with that diversity, how do you keep abreast of like the cultural aspect of every single crop, or do you just have to be good enough for most of things? Um, always learning, honestly. Okay. <laughs> um, the internet is my best friend. Um, Facebook has been great. There's a bunch of groups on Facebook. If yep. I have a question, you know, I'm not afraid to ask. I mean, I've done this for full time since 1979, but I don't know everything. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Lear learning is living as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Now you also are growing some different cropping systems. I see some like hydroponics as well as just in ground growing. Talk us through a little bit of the, the strategy there. Well, we don't do any hydroponics yet, but we do a lot of container growing in the greenhouses. Okay. Um, all, of our, all, of, all of our tomatoes now are grafted and grown in the greenhouses. Uh, we don't grow any more tomatoes out in the field. Um, we just get a better yield and a better quality tomato coming out of the greenhouses. Um, we do do a lot of microgreens and uh, lettuces and that type of stuff in the greenhouse also. Okay. Um, okay. So, then, always, so what I'm sorry. seeing then, yeah, is the tomatoes in pots that are, so what's, what, how many gallon pots are those? Um, we use a five gallon pot. Um, we can reuse it for a number of years. We sanitize it every year when we use it. Um, yep. we, san actually, we sanitize everything. We even sanitize our, our strings that we hang up. Um, and all our clips. Yep. So we start with clean conditions every year in the greenhouse. Um, last year was our first year growing year round. So okay. we, did our, we did our CSA year round last year. Okay. Gotcha. Now um, with the growing in the pots, are you, how often do those get water? They have uh, drip tubes in them. Uh, they go on every day, depending on the temperature and how much the sun is out. Um, they can go on twice a day when the sunlight starts to become less and the days get less. Of course, the watering gets less. Yep. Uh, we use just enough water for the plants. We don't want the floor of the greenhouse getting wet. Yep. Um, and is that an automated system? And how do you keep, is that like based on like a probe in there that tells it how much water it needs or someone's manually watching that? No, I honestly, I don't like things overly automated. So we okay. actually manually go in there. Um, sometimes if things are too automated, you don't pay attention yes. as much as you probably yep. should. You know, so I do like, I like eyes on. I like to get in there and look at things, put your hands in there, um, physically get in there and look at, look at the greenhouses yeah. and the fields and the fields also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then would you consider yourself, uh, what kind of growing systems you would say conventional non-certified organic? We always try to use the organic control first. Okay. Yeah. Um, if there is not a good organic control, like I haven't found a good organic control for white fly yet. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as far as a large scale, at least outside, um, yes. in, the green, in the greenhouse is a little easier, um, but outside, so if we can't use an organic control, we use only non-restricted use pesticides. So you don't need to be licensed for them. Yep, yep. We, ne we never use um, anything that we would have to record or report to DEP, DEEP. Yep. Um, so I guess I am a, I'm not an organic grower because I can't say the O word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, we always try to go that way first. At, at heart, I'm an organic grower, you know it, so that's yeah. the way I want to, that's the way I want to grow. Um, I'm just not ready to commit to organic yet. Gotcha. Nope. That makes sense. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, kind of like your tillage systems in the field. I see you've got some discs and then after, let's say you disc, do you rototill or what's your process for making the beds and getting stuff planted? So we usually do go out and disc first, uh, yep. and then we plow, then we flip it. Um, after that, we disc it one more time, and then we send our rotor tiller down to make the seed, you know, the bed. Um, we have an eight-foot rotor tiller goes behind our hundred horsepower tractor, and uh, it does a makes a beautiful bed, completely level, not a stone in it. It's yeah. When we go, if we go, if we seed direct, we actually have to roll the bed with a roller first because the soil is so soft and fluffy and. Gotcha. And I was going to ask about that. So what, what do you use for a roller? Is it like a lawn roller or do you make something specific? 
Um, it's actually it is an old horse drawn <laughs> steel steel roller. Um, it's okay. eight feet. It's eight feet wide. Goes behind the back of the tractor. Um, it's been here since I was a little kid. We resurrected okay. it. We resurrected it. Rebuilt it, and uh, it's just a pull behind. Uh, it's it's got to weigh you know five six hundred pounds. Yeah. Uh, roller. Yeah. Yeah. We have a pretty sandy soil too. So I've actually been trying to figure out how to implement that on my farm and we haven't quite found the right roller, but it's, yeah. It's, um, yeah. Luckily it was here when I, when I got here. So uh, like I said, we rebuilt it and uh, it works great. Um, it actually has five separate rollers in the back. So it, it actually makes the lines in the ground. Um, so you know exactly where you're planting. Oh, interesting. So it's got five connected sections and then, so you're planting four rows then? We, on some things we do like radishes. Yeah. We'll, we'll plant with our, we have, uh, oh, I forgot the name of it, but it's the, uh, the, the little planter you pull that drops four rows at a time. Uh, yep. yep. Like a Jang or, uh, well, we have Jangs too. We have an earth earthway, earthway. Um, but this is, yeah, this is, uh, for planting really small seeds. Like Stein, Steinway, uh, no, I'd have to look at it. It's Johnny's does sell it. I know they sell it. Okay. Um, but, but anyways, that plants four rows at a time. So we're actually planting 16 rows in one row. Um, oh, like a, it's like the pit, is it a pinpoint seeder? Yeah, it's a pinpoint seeder. There you go. Okay. So that's what you use for your little greens and stuff. Right. For the, for this real small seed. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And we do seed all of our own seedlings um, um, at our greenhouses. We have seven greenhouses. Yep. So we start, all, start all our own plugs for the fields. Okay. And now do you also do, I see some like hanging baskets. Do you do a lot of flowers or just a few flowers? We just do a few. Um, we really decorate the farm pretty well. Um, we have farm camps that go on. We have field trips that go on. We do um, community things. We do corporate events. Um, so we try to keep the place looking really nice. Yep. Um, the old uh, manure spreader is actually filled with flowers. Yep. next to the building um so we do we do grow a few flowers um you know to sell to our customers especially our csa members um, but most of the flowers are used on the farm gotcha that's actually a very interesting way of doing it and so then you probably don't have a, any or very little extra um so you're not throwing a lot of transplants away at the end of the season yeah um every once in a while we'll, we'll you know, if the weather's not right, they'll get past this a little bit. But uh, yeah. for the most part, we try to time it so we use them all. Um, we just fi just finishing up seeding all of our uh, late fall brassicas. Yep. So we're getting uh, getting ready to. We're actually getting some fields ready. We'll probably start planting some of those really soon. Gotcha. Yep. Now you also do like Christmas pots and that kind of stuff. Is that uh, the greenery we brought in, and then you just guys assemble them, or they come in like? Yeah. That? No. No. We uh, we we do. We we bring in the greenery and we uh, we build them up. You know, from scratch. Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah, you get a, a great job with your Instagram, so people should really definitely check out your Instagram. Well, thank you. I just I was just talking to uh, the girl that works with me, and she kind of does that that end of it for me. Um, and I said we've been slacking a little bit on our Instagram. We got to got to pick up the. Uh, yeah. Pick up the pace here again. Yeah, but it's the.leaf.ct. So definitely check that out, folks. Um, now let's talk about the education aspect of it because you do a, a, a ton of education on the farm. We um, do. And that's, that's why we became a 501c3. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about um, how that business structure works with it being an existing farm um, with, you know, obviously you got the farm stand and the CSA, but also the education side. Um, is there anything particular you had to kind of like figure out or was it pretty simple of moving to that business structure? Well, as you, you know, um, farming can be very volatile. Um, you know, you can have a great spring and maybe not have a good summer and fall, you know, weather, weather is always messing with us. So we tried to make it so there's a, a steadier stream of income that is agriculture related, um, we we're, were trying to trying to make it more like an even cash flow for the farm uh -huh. year round. So we toyed with a bunch of things and education seemed to be, you know, we we're already doing a little bit, but we were funding it out of our own pockets. We, at that point, we we're an LLC. So we're, so we, we thought, you know, why don't we try to expand this, get more involved in, in the community. Um, and the 501c3 was the way to go because it enabled us to get grants 
Yeah. Um, people are more willing to donate to a nonprofit than a for-profit business. Absolutely. Which is under, it's understandable. Um, so yeah, the, the 501c3 um, really has, has made our education portion of the farm grow. I mean, and it continues to grow. Um, we have school gardens at every school in town. Now we have a, our, our town has 43,000 people in it. We have eight elementary schools, two middle schools, an alternative education school, a bunch wow. of learning centers and a high school. And we have school gardens at every school now. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, same thing. We do a farm camp. We do three weeks. Of, uh, we do six weeks of farm camp. Um, the first two weeks are with middle schoolers from sixth to ninth grade. Um, okay. Sells out every year. Um, the next two weeks are for IDD um, students. So intellectual and developmental disability students. And that keeps growing every year. That is done through the school system. We actually have special education teachers on site, um, paraprofessionals. It, it's, it's a big project. Um, and then we go back to two more weeks of farm camp. Okay. For so me, farm camp is the funnest time of the year, if you ask me. Oh, it um, sounds like a blast. I, I love working with the kids, the, the middle schoolers, you know, they're they're not fully developed yet. So they have a mind of their own and, um, mm -hmm. they're, but they're sponges. They're willing to learn at the same time. So you, you never know what's going to come out of them. <laughs> yeah. So then with the, talk to us, like what happens during farm camp? So typical day, um, they come to camp, we have a welcome, you know, we talk about what they did the day before. Um, they can do anything, um, from like yesterday, we actually, we have two baby doll sheep. We had two VOAG teachers come out. They learned how to shear the sheep, clear, clip their hoofs, um, how to feed them, how to take care of them. Uh, today, we had a chef come out and they learned how to, you know, they went out in the fields, they picked the, the products that we were going to need. Mm -hmm. um, they had learned about food safety. They learned how to prepare the food. They learned how the, what they picked affects their health. Yeah. Um, we had a VOAG student come out the other day and they did a chicken show. He taught them how to show chickens. We have, uh, I don't know, we have about 50 chickens on the farm too. Yeah, and um, that was Chef Dan so they, that came out. Chef Dan, yep. I just put yep. that post up just a few minutes ago. Yes, looks um, good. Now, so do you grow corn on the farm? We don't. We don't have enough land to grow the corn. We buy our corn in. Now, that's something we're actually struggling with right now is finding a reliable, good local source of sweet corn. Yeah, we have quite a few producers in central Connecticut. Um, the one we were with for years just retired last year. So that was hard. Mm. Um, but but we, we, we're lucky enough. We do have enough local and uh, some great corn producers in Connecticut. Yeah. So then you, you buy it in the corn, but then everything else is grown. So they actually are able to walk around the farm and like pick the peppers or pick the, 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 the lettuce or whatever they're using. Yeah, they left today uh, with a, a leaf shopping tote that was probably filled with 25 pounds of produce. Yeah, they went out. We went out with the tractor and the trailer and uh, took a ride through the fields. And if they liked it, they got to pick it and take it home. And uh, we gave them some recipes. And yeah, they do something different every day. It, it really is a fun camp. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but you know what? The kids... I have campers that come back for, for multiple sessions. And uh, I'll, half of my campers this session were repeats from last year. So they wow. come back year after year. So it's a lot of fun. So how do you, how do you price the, the camps then? So the camp is actually done through our local YMCA. Um, okay. We have what's called camp slopers in, in, in town. And uh, this session, they have 800 campers. Um, we had, we have 13. We only, we only, we limit the number we take just so we can do it right. Yeah. Um, but they have, they have a big program. So they do all the organization for me. Um, they yeah. actually deliver the campers. They go to camp sloper in the morning. Then they come to us right after they go to camp, they get dropped off here. Um, so they do a lot of the legwork for me. Okay. Which is nice. Which is so they, nice. Yeah. The kids just show up. I'm sure they have that signed all the waivers and all of that. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So let's say then, and do you feel like the education drives sales for them bringing the, their parents back to shop the stand? Um, bottom line is everything should drive sales. Okay. <laughs> everything we do. Um, you know, the, the, the farm won't survive on, 
on just farming alone. It won't survive on just education alone. They both work together. Gotcha. So, you know, we're always promoting, always, you know, the kids went home with T-shirts with our name on them. They went home with uh, shopping bags with our name on them. Um, we're always branding. Um, you, yeah, you have to, if you're going to raise it, you've got to sell it. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's nothing doing you no good just sitting out there. No, it's not. If you can raise product and you can't sell it, you can be the best farmer in the world, but uh, you won't be around long. Yes. So talk to me about the school gardens. How did you set that up? It started with just a couple gardens and um, one school found out the other one had a garden and uh, we ended up in all the schools. We actually raise all the product for them. We supply all their product. We supply their soil amendments. We go out and prepare their beds for them. And then um, when their beds are ready, we get the kids to actually come out and help do the planting. Um, once they're planting, we are basically there if they need us for instructionals or you know questions. Um, but usually the PTO or the science department or something will take over and continue the garden for the season. Um, but we do end up going back to gardens quite often and helping out. But the, the, they're, they're all, all the gardens are done at no cost to the school. Um, we actually go out and seek the grants and seek the funding so we can do this. Um, it doesn't cost our school system anything. Cool. That's awesome because that's a lot easier to sell to them without them having to think about budgeting or finding the money for it. Always. Yeah, they're, they always seem to be running tight. Yeah, yeah. So what kind of events do you run besides the farm camp? Because I know you do a fair number of those as well. Yep. So we have had, um, we've had corporate events like bonding events where uh, a group of uh, people that work for corporations will come out and, uh, you know, we will do the same kind of thing where we'll have the chef come out, teach them how to cook. We'll go out and maybe cut flowers and teach them flower arranging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we kind of gear it to what they think they want to do. Um, sometimes they're catered. Sometimes we, we have people cater them, w whatever, whatever interests them. We try to adapt to gotcha. work, work for them. So all of this that you've described takes a huge team. It takes, it takes a lot of work. I work a lot of hours <laughs> and, <laughs> I have a, and I honestly have a great team too. Um, you know, my, my people that work for me are great. They're always there. Never say no. So. Yeah. How many people do you have on during the middle of the summer working for you? Right now we have about 10. Okay. Um, it gets down when, it, when the slow season comes, it gets down to three or four counting, my, uh, not counting myself. So yeah. Um, two of them work year round, no matter what's going on, they're always here doing something. Yeah. So then how do you structure the team? Do you have specific areas of responsibility? Um, how do you have that, that structure set up? We do. We do. Um, everybody has their own jobs. Everybody's responsible for certain things. Um, you know, there, there is a pecking order that is set and uh, the rules and, and uh, job job guidelines are set up. Yes. Gotcha. And then how have you, you know, brought on team members and what's your hiring process look like? Uh, most everybody ends up like family at the end. So uh -huh. we're very specific on, you know, who comes in, you know, who we have work for us. Um, we have had, you know, it, Farming is kind of funny because there seems to be a lot of turnover because we use a lot of younger people. Um, we yeah. use a lot of high school kids and college kids. Um, and they usually do stay with me. If they start in high school, they usually stay with me up to college. And if they're going to school locally, sometimes through college. But if they're not going to school for agriculture, um, you know, they're going to go on to their, what they're going to school for. Um, I've had a lot of teachers, doctors, all, all different kind of kids that, you know, have gone into different growing, different areas. Uh -huh. um, and been successful. Um, we basically teach them how to work and responsibility, you know, how to show up for work every day and uh, you're responsible for, for things when you get to work. So we do have turnover that way. Um, you know, people just outgrow the job. Yeah. Sometimes, but we do have our people that stay with us year round. You know, we have a certain crew that stay, sticks around, you know, this is what they want to do and this is what they're doing. Yeah. And it just works. Yeah, it does. It, it seems to work. And, you know, the, the turnover is expected. You know, it's not because they don't want to work. It's because they've, they've outgrown the job and they're ready to their next phase of life. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. 
Hey, Thriving Farmers, we're back with another tip from Harvest Host. Now, Molly, talk to us about your new online reservation tool. Yeah, we're really excited about this one. I think we have a lot of people probably in your audience too that are listening that thought, hmm, this is a great program. Harvest Host sounds like something I would like to do, but I'm nervous about keeping track of the members coming in or the bookings. And so we've launched an online reservation tool for our member or for our host locations to oversee with their host profile, making it super easy to book um, and to accept or decline our members coming through. Um, it is uh, located on your host profile. Um, you're able to see who wants to come in and when. So you can dictate the calendar, kind of like an Airbnb type setup. So if there are specific days you want to be open, you can list those out with the hours. If you have to block out dates for any closings you might have or special events coming in that you need to focus 100% of your capacity on, you can do that. So you truly as a host location can control who comes in and out alongside the accepting or declining requests that come in through our membership. So on that end, you're also able to see member reviews. So you're able to see how a member has been reviewed in the past from specific host locations. Um, that will help maybe dictate who you want in and out of your mm -hmm. location. And then we also just launched an SMS text initiative. So you're able to get any request that comes through straight to your phone, making it super easy. You know, all of you on the farming side or outside, or you're, yeah. you're helping customers or you are running around. And so it kind of makes it easier to control those requests coming in and easily get yourself set up on the calendar. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit about your flower production because I see that you do a fair amount of those as well. Yeah, that's been growing. Uh, the cut flower business. Um, one of the girls, one of my main girls that works for me, actually, she's my right hand. Um, she actually, we, we always did a little bit. And she's like, well, I really want to try flowers. And I'm like, well, don't leave. We're going to try it here. <laughs> yeah. So we've really expanded it this year. We actually did an acre of cut flowers. Um, and she's been growing that into the business. And I told her, I said, well, it's a way to, we already have all the infrastructure. We have big coolers, we have the fields, we have the equipment. I says, do it here, figure it out. If it's something you really want to do, you know, and then you want to go out on your own. Okay. But uh, let's try it here and get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. So that, that part of the business has been growing. Um, we, this, this, we do it as a CSA. We do some restaurants. Um, we do, we do just sales too, you know, during CSA, uh, during our, through our farm stand. We also have a donation program where people have donated money. And so we, we cut flowers, make bouquets and bring them down to one of the uh, nursing homes, oh. which, is really, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so it's community. It's basically community funded. It's almost like a CSA for the nursing home. Um, so. And, and you have nice. others it's, fund it's, that. It's nice to give back. Yeah. We have others fund it. We always kick in extra too. You know, we always yeah. put our, put our two cents into yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting way to do that. And it allows, yeah, it allows people to feel more involved in the farm, I'm sure, and involved in the community. Yeah. And we do that for our CSA program too. Um, we, we have roughly 300 members. Okay. And um, we also put this out there. Um, we, we work for, with Network for Good for a lot of our donation stuff. And we ask our members, we ask anybody that, that um, through social media, anybody that follows us, if you'd like to donate, um, donate to us. We put that money towards CSA program, towards the CSA program. And what we do is every week while we're doing our CSA, we make the bags and we send them down to our local uh, community service, our, our soup kitchen. So last year we did, uh, I think it was 15 half shares, which feeds a family of four uh, for 18 weeks. So we fed 15 families for 18 weeks with that donation program. Um, this year it seems like donations are down a little bit because I think people are out, they're loose, they're not uh, staying home and cooking as much. So I think we're doing eight, eight this year, but it's, okay. it's, it's pretty cool, pretty cool because a, a lot of the uh, community services and the soup kitchens, um, a lot of that stuff is box stuff. They don't get a lot of fresh stuff. Yes. So these, these, these families are getting fresh local produce, our produce um, every week for 18 weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's, is, one of, one, that's one of the big frustrations as I see through this. It's great that the government is, you know, putting these food donations and stuff together, but the fresh product is so important for people's health. Yeah. And, and even uh, the government had a program too, where they um, were asking farmers to, to build boxes and, and send them to soup kitchens and they were going to pay for them. And, it, but you had to bid on them. And uh, what happened was that a lot of the middlemen 
we're yep. actually in bidding on these things. And there's no way the local farmer can compete with the middleman that's pulling the stuff from down south. I mean, uh, I mean, our minimum yep. wage is, is, is so much higher up here in the northeast than it is in the south. So our costs are higher. We can't compete you know, with those those products. So yeah. we, we didn't get involved in those programs. Um, we'd love to, to send, we'd love to send our whole crop to the soup kitchen if we could, but you know, we, we do have to get paid for it at some point. So, yeah. What kind of challenges have you seen with obviously, you know, Connecticut's getting very full, less developable land, developmental land. Um, have you seen any challenges with that encroachment of, um, you know, surrounding houses or just people not understanding what a real farm is? Um, there has been a disconnect, um, especially with young people um, thinking that most of their, their food comes from the grocery store. Um, we try to teach them that uh, there is a farmer somewhere that has grown that product. Um, you know, the, 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 it doesn't come from a grocery store. It comes from a farm. Yeah. So just the disconnect. Now, another thing is what about regulations? Because I'm sure those, those have tightened. Are you been, you know, grandfathered in as it were on many of what you do, or you just have enough land that you're able to do like the animals and that sort of thing without too many problems? Um, I really don't, we don't have many problems in that end. Um, you know, there's always the, the changing, uh, like the FISMA and all that stuff. Um, yeah. But, you know, those are things we have to do. Um, we really haven't had too many problems regulation wise. You know, uh, the town actually works with us. Yeah. Um, our town supports us. You know, they're, they're, they're right behind us. Um, some of the land that we use is town land. So, um, and plus we're, we're tied in with the school system. So we, we have uh, three words that we really live by in a farm, um, inclusion, education, and community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, without our community, we're nothing. Um, we want to educate people on what we do, how food is, our food is healthy. You know, it's good for them yeah. and inclusion. We don't want anybody to feel left out. We have programs, um, for everybody. Um, if the gate is open, everybody, anybody is welcome to come onto the farm and, you know, see the animals, say hello. Um, you know, we, we want everybody to be included. Yeah. And you're kind of like right in town too. We are right in the center of suburbia. Yeah. Yeah. Like yes, I, I, I border my land, our land that we use borders probably 30 homes. Yeah. And your farm store is, um, okay. I'm just trying to, I'm looking at the, the map right here. Is the farm stand there on the corner or is that a different? Um, store? That, that was our farm store. Um, we actually got we got out of that part of the retail. We have another farm stand that we use. Um, it's in a different location. Okay. Um, yeah, we saw we saw changing. You know, the we also have. You know, I'll just give you a little little insight to our town. We have two Home Depots, one Lowe's, a Walmart, five grocery stores. Wow. So they're all trying to sell the same thing that we grow. Yeah. Uh, so is we had we used to have a big retail. We had a, a three thousand foot square, a three thousand square foot retail with a bakery. Yeah. Um, yeah. We decided at that point, with all those competitors being in town, they're all taking a piece of the pie to get out of that part of it. So that's why we've expanded the CSA yep. and education. But we also do a small farm stand. It's on a corner of one of the streets. Um, ah. It's actually kind of, kind of near the Camp Sloper YMCA. It's right around the corner. Yep. Um, we do it three days a week for two hours a day and that's it. Um, okay. but we, we also have an online store. Yep. So the, on, the online store, especially last year has, has grown substantially. Um, you can, you can get anything we grow on our online store. It's all done curbside pickup. Um, yep. it's all picked, it's all picked the day you want it. So that's interesting. So how, uh, what kind of, uh, software are you using to manage that online store? Um, we use our, our platform is Equid. Okay. Um, we are, I actually, myself and the girl that works with me, um, we actually service the store and our website. So okay. we do a lot of that. We do a lot of that in-house. Um, and then all the donations are actually run through network for good. Um, yep. so everything, everything is done online. Everything is, you know, there's, there's always, there's, you know, easy tracking. Um, yep. It's, it's very professional. It's very, very easy to manage. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the online store now and seeing how that's laid out. Um, very cool. Now uh, you got aprons and you got, you know, shirts and stuff, farms, mean food. I love that. 
man, that's great. And that's, and that's true. That's true. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We're, I think like obviously six generations behind you with our farm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't know if there'll be an eighth. I have two girls. Um, yeah. one of them is a special education teacher. Okay. And the other one is just going to college this year. Um, so being a nonprofit, I'm hoping even if the girls don't come onto it, that somebody else can continue it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, I'm just trying to think what other questions. I mean, there's so many aspects of your business. I mean, we could deep dive into so much of it. Um, oh, it's, it's, you know what, at the end of the year, we look back and we're like, how did we get it all done? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now the animals, talk to us about the animals. That's, is that mainly for the people to see and interest and that sort of thing? They're strictly education. Uh, okay. um, no animals were harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we have approximately 50 chickens, uh, six ducks, two goats, two baby doll sheep, a baby pig, some rabbits, some guinea pigs. Yeah. Uh, but they're all for education purposes. They, they live the best lives ever, I'll tell you. Um, they eat a lot of vegetables. They know they're not going to ever be harmed. They're all super friendly too. So like when we have farm camp, the kids spend a, a good hour of the day with the animals. Yeah. Um, you know, in the middle of suburbia, you're not going to run into too many goats or too many pigs, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it's really neat for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. We have some legal hurdles to get around with that in our town because technically most of the animals are prohibited. Okay. Um, but I'm pretty sure that we can get some sort of variance and stuff because we have eight acres and I don't, it's not, I think the biggest thing is the smell and the noise. And I, we can pretty much show that that won't be a problem for our neighbors. Yeah, and we will be fine. We have no roosters and you know what? Most of the animals we have are relatively quiet. Um, I mean, we, we yeah. literally have neighbors um, 150 feet from us where the animals are. Yeah. And, uh, Never any complaints. Um, and we use, we have smaller animals, you know, we don't, we don't have any cows or Buffalo or anything. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and the neighbors are all invited to come see the animals too. I mean, I, I get along with all my neighbors, uh, you know, I invite them to the farm. If, if I can help them at all, I ever do. Yeah. 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 We have a really open policy with our neighbors too, because again, they, they have to deal with a little different than most neighbors and what they're not maybe quite expecting. So we try to be, Super. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier if, if they're friendly with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, just talk to us about um, kind of, you know, you went with a nonprofit. Um, you're doing the education. What year did that kind of change for you? When, when did you start thinking along that line? 2016, we started the educational programs. Okay. Um, actually, 2014. Sorry. 2014, we started the educational programs. 2016, we became a nonprofit. Um, okay. So you just saw the writing on the wall and just started slowly making the transition. Yeah. Um, and, and I loved working with the kids anyways, because we'd already been in the school systems and yeah. we just really wanted to grow that end of it. Um, as far as, you know, education and, uh, you know, they're just, they're, they're fun. They're fun to be around they're, you, Like I said, you never know what's going to come out of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Another thing is you are very clearly the face of the farm. Um, that's one of the things you're looking through your website and even like the, the Instagram and that sort of thing. Uh, is that intentional? Is that you, are you farmer Mark to the community? How does that work? I, it's funny if I go to the grocery store and, uh, you know, I, I see kids that I maybe saw in school, help them plant their garden or something. Yeah. They come up here. Hey, farmer Mark. Yeah. Or they'll tell, or they'll tell their parents, Hey, I saw him on the videos at school. Yeah. Uh, cause, cause we did, we actually put together a series of videos for the school systems during COVID. Um, because they couldn't come to the farm. So we yeah. had professional professional videos made up so we could go to them. Oh, very um, cool. I am known as kind of farmer Mark, honestly. It's yeah. Um, maybe my wife wouldn't would like me to be known as something else sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, it's it's a cool thing. And um, you know, I, I like to get all my help out there, the pictures of my help too. Uh, you know, if yep, you look yep. at a lot, a lot of the vi pictures, you know, I try to get them in there too, to make them feel involved because yes. they are, they're, yep. they're, I'm nothing, I'm nothing without my help. Yeah. So, yeah. I see them um, making boxes here and, uh, yeah, a bunch of like holding greens and stuff. Yeah. Here, so. you're, you're only as good as your help. So yeah, that's the truth. Um, 
And I think the other thing too, is you're really into inclusion and inviting all people to the farm um, and really making it a welcoming place. Um, so I think that's really cool. I think- um, Yeah, we, we tell people, yeah. we, have, we have no secrets. If you have a question, ask. Um, even if it's about our, you know, if it's about the food, about how we raise it, yeah. um, ask. You know, we, we, have, we have, have no reason to hide anything. So um, yeah, we're an open book. Yeah, yeah, no, this is really cool. Anything you'd like to leave with our audience before you go? Um, you know, just if you're going to be a farmer, you better be optimistic. Yeah. Keep smiling because, uh, the better days tomorrow, you know, you might have a bad day today, but tomorrow's going to be a good one. Um, and hopefully, uh, we'll get more people involved in farming. You know, we, even if yeah. there's small, small farms, you know, small farms, we need more small farmers around. So that's why we do the education too. You know, hopefully, uh, we can reach, reach some young people and, uh, get them to go into some sort of, sort of agriculture, you know? Yeah. Is that part of the reason you do the education? Cause you just see so many people not doing agriculture and see how necessary it is. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, if, like you said, if you, if you read my shirt, farms mean food. So, um, we, we definitely got to get more young people involved. Yeah. Because, yeah. because we need to, we sure need to eat. I like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all uh, eat three I, I, times a day. Yeah, I, uh, that's why I have to work so hard to make sure I don't get too big, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that is especially in the last in the last year, we've seen just with the pandemic and look at California this year, that our food system is too um, centralized and that if we don't regionalize it more, then we are going to be some major issues. Um, I mean, looking at last year and just seeing for like, you know, some weeks in some grocery stores, there was no fruits and vegetables on the counters. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, we, we did not say no to anybody last year as far as for food. And if anybody couldn't afford to pay for it, we still made sure they got food. Um, yeah. You have to eat. I mean, it's, you have to yeah. eat. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing else to say. Yes. Yeah. You can live without an right. iPhone, but you have to eat. Right. Yeah. And, uh, cool. Hopefully, hopefully you'll eat something healthy, like vegetables. Yes. Yes. Now your, your bags, I see those, are those like an insulated tote or are they just a regular tote bag? No, they're just a regular tote. Um, last year was very expensive because of COVID. We, we couldn't take any of the bags back. So every week they got a brand new bag. Oh, wow. Um, this, this year, now that they said that the COVID does not live on surfaces like they thought, uh, a lot of people have donated their bags back to us. So you have so an we, overabundance now. <laughs> well, we don't have an overabundance, but we haven't had to spend the money we did last year. So that's a nice thing. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing, yeah. nothing's getting wasted. You know, we, we reuse them and recycle them. Uh, we always try to be pretty green on the farm too. You know, we do composting. We have a solar array going on our big brick storage, storage building. So we're hoping to cut our electricity way back. Um, you know, we try to be as green as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and that's a great, that's a great teaching tool too, for the kids. Yes. Yeah. Be able to walk them through the different aspects of that. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, coming on, sharing your story and kind of uh, the education, the education aspect, you know, really excites me. I really haven't done any of that. That's not, we've done farm tours, but um, again, where we're located, we're in the middle of um, two school systems, literally less than three minutes, three minutes from yeah, us. Get, get them involved. And they're happy to get involved. Um, yeah. the kids, the kids love it. I mean, you know, kids, kids will tell you they don't like a tomato, but if you get them to grow it in their garden and they go out and they pick it, they're going to try it. They might yeah. like a tomato. They might like it, you know, yeah. um, the hands-on aspect of it really is different. You know, it's, it's hard to sit in a classroom for eight hours. Yeah. But go, now, out, go out, go out to your school garden and get your hands dirty and, you know, enjoy it. Now, I also see that you do a lot of experiments. Like I see a field of red carrots in bulb crates. Tell me about that. Yeah, we're always trying something new and uh, it, it worked out pretty well. Um, there's certain types of carrots that do a lot better. You've got to use the shorter varieties. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Parisian carrots, the uh, round carrots, um, they do really well. We've actually done those in hanging pots too. Oh, wow. Um, it's just a way to try to extend our season into the greenhouses and, you know, even start stuff earlier. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it works out if you're doing the CSA, you know, because it's something different on a large scale, it probably wouldn't be profitable. Um, yeah. but on a smaller, yeah. a smaller scale, you know, to keep the CSA members happy with different product, it works. Um, it's also enables us to utilize all the space in between the greenhouses. 
So, you know, we set up pallets in between the greenhouses to grow that stuff there. Um, otherwise it's, you know, eight feet, eight to 10 feet uh, between the greenhouses, it's wasted. Yeah, and in a Connecticut, every square foot counts. And we grow on every inch of property we have, we're trying to grow on it. And we, we're, we're trying to crop things two times at least. Yeah. Uh, in, green, in the greenhouses, you know, it's multiple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. All right, and cool. Well, thanks, go ahead. We're always open to new ideas too. I mean, you know, like I said, social media is great. We, we you know, we get ideas from there too. Um, made some friends on the social media. You know, I'm not afraid to ask them, you know, how do you, how'd you do this? Does he think it works? And um, the computer's probably our best tool we have. Yes. Yep. I absolutely agree. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Mark, and sharing your wisdom. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I love the podcast. Um, it's funny because we do listen to it. Oh, we're really? In, when, we're in the, when we're in the greenhouses, we listen to it all winter. I think I've heard every show you've done. Uh, oh, that's uh, funny. When we're out in the tractors, forget it. You get put to the back burner, but uh, we catch up We catch up in the off season. Well, that's interesting because I'm, I was telling um, my farm manager, I said, I only think I have like three dozen people left that listen to the podcast. <laughs> but Yeah, no, um, we, uh, we definitely uh, we listen to it. And uh, I've got my crew listening to it with me. They're like, can't can we put on the radio? And I, I listen to talk radio anyway. So yeah, uh, yeah. I'm like, no, it's time to learn. Yeah. Now, so the, interestingly enough, I'm inside in the office mostly during the winter time, but in the field, I have my um, my headphones on, my you know, and I Bluetooth, and I just listen to things during the summer, so I can get catch up with most things during the summer. Huh. But in the winter, I can't. Yeah. See, I'm I'm ro I'm actually rocking out on my my track there. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've got my headphones on too, but it's uh, yeah, yeah, classic rock, classic rock. All right, that's what keeps you going. Yeah. Sometimes those rows are long and uh, especially if you're cultivating, it takes, uh, you, you got to keep stay awake to get to the other end, you know? Yes. So then cultivation, one final question before you go, are you set up, let's say basket weeders, sweeps, that sort of thing? I see you have a couple different offset tractors. We do. We have uh, three of the uh, old farm walls. Yep. Uh, all set up a little differently. Um, and then we have one uh, three point hitch cultivator that we use. Um I don't have any baskets and I don't have any um, finger weeders yet. Yeah. But I'd love to see how they work and uh, um, maybe someday. Um, yeah. But right now it's mostly conventional cultivators on the old farm walls and uh, we have fertilizer hoppers attached too. So we can fertilize while we're cultivating uh, a lot of plastic culture, put a lot of yep. plastic down, a lot of different colored plastic we were trying out. Uh, we tried some silver with onions this year and I don't think I'm a fan. Yeah. Well, uh, it's you have to wear sunglasses. Uh, that too, but the onions just didn't do what I wanted them to. Interesting. Um, but we, we do a lot of white plastics and black plastic. Um, like I said, most of the tomatoes in the greenhouse, so we don't use any red. Yeah. But uh, uh, the flowers are most of them are on plastic uh, with um, three foot uh, weed fabric in between the walkways. Yep. That's exactly how yeah. we do it. Now, yeah. we did sweet potatoes and winter squash on both white and black. Um, okay. I'm doing, that's the trial I'm doing this year is doing it on both and kind of seeing what the results are. Um, so we did, yeah. we did watermelons and cantaloupes on white and we did our potatoes on white. Um, and is that to cool the soil? That's to cool it. Um, and you want to cool because you're it, so hot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wide open field. Um, it's fine sandy loom. So it does get pretty hot. Um, yeah. we, we use black earlier in the season for the first brassicas. Yep to push them a little bit and then we'll use it towards the later part of the season. Um, it's a little tricky though, because when you're setting out the seedlings and if you use them black, it can get too hot. Yes. So what we do is we spray surround on that and then that whites it out for a week or two. While okay. They okay. Um, and that seems to work really well. And then of course it also covers the, pl the plants and that keeps the flea beetles or if in case of um, squash, the uh, cucumber beetles off. Yeah, and they're still around, uh, just yeah. cultivating. Uh, they were still jumping on the tractor a little bit, so. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, those yeah. Are, the trials are interesting. And I'm assuming the side dressers, because your sandy loam is so light, you have to keep spoon feeding throughout the season. We do, we on uh, certain yeah. crops. Um, but we also do, we're kind of fortunate that there are, in our town, uh, we have leaf pickup. Yes, and they nice. actually, they actually, they windrow the leaves on our property and flip them and turn them to compost. And uh, every few years we'll compost the fields. Um, nice. So, so our soil is very rich. We still have to add some lime back to it, but uh, weed pressure can be really high from, from doing that. 
but it also helps with water retention too. So you're, you're giving up something on the, on, you know, as far as you got to do a lot more cultivating, Yeah. but uh, we're, we're feeding a little bit less and um, definitely helps with water retention and uh, it keeps the soil nice and loose too. Yeah. Yeah. So pro, I, pros and pros and cons. Now I see you have a whole pad for the compost, right? Yeah. It's about a, it's gotta be about an acre and a half part of a piece of field. Yeah. And then that they've taken, you, and they've taken the topsoil off of it. They windrow it. Um, and then they actually, the town that comes in with their machine and they actually flip it all. And, uh, Oh, wow. So you work working, the working with the town, you know, it's, it's, it's huge yeah, for us. Absolutely. Very cool. And so they just do that for you or do they do that? And then they sell it to other people or they do, just- they do, they disperse it to other people too. They actually uh, take some back to the town, uh, to the highway department. And they actually distribute it to the uh, uh, residents also. Yep. Uh, um, there's so many leaves in town. <laughs> yeah. We could never use, we could never use it all. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate your time and uh, best of luck with the rest of the season. Yeah, you too, Michael. Uh, hopefully everybody has a good year. Uh, you know, it's been pretty, pretty good here. Uh, been wet up here in Connecticut this year, um, but we have rolling, rolling hills and sandy loom. So usually if it rains, we can get back on the field the next day. So, yeah, uh, which is luckier than most, but uh, hopefully everybody has a good year. Absolutely. All we right. Need more, we need more farmers. Absolutely. We do. Thanks so much, Mark. All right, Michael. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, Thriving Farmers, have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about, you know, some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.